So today I wanted to talk about role models. Um, role models I think are an interesting topic because I think that somewhat, we begin, when we grow up, uh, we begin to somewhat overlook them. I think we do a really good job with kids. Kids we know need role models. I think role models are kind of um, like a, it's, it's kind of like a free skip. Um, kids lack a, an experience base on which to, uh, a foundation on which to make their decisions. So we encourage them to look up and aspire to be like uh, particular role models, which are very good. Um, and that's kind of like a skip because then they can base their decisions and their actions off of somebody else's experience, somebody who's, who's had to go through a process of trial and error and figure things out on their own. Um, and that saves children from, and, and kids and young adults from having to make those same mistakes. So it's kind of like a free pass. You skip some of the trial and error by having a role model. And that's good, but I think that when, once, we, once we grow up, we begin, we've, once we've kind of got that experience base, that foundation in life, we, we don't feel the need to really look up to role models anymore and we begin to look, look inside. And that's good. It's good that we look inside, but it's, uh, it's important to have concrete people that we look outside of ourselves that we can examine in a good way. Um, and compare ourselves with in a good way. It's, uh, I, I think it's somewhat, it's somewhat dangerous when we, uh, when we forget to look uh, and, and compare ourselves in that good way because we, we, uh, it, it, it becomes very easy for us to be swayed. Uh, and we, we see that Paul warns us of this when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived, for bad company corrupts good morals. We are very much uh, swayed by the people that we entertain. We, uh, we are flexible. Uh, we're, we're warned again in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. You know, this isn't, when he says the companions, uh, when, when the writer uh, says that the companion of fools will suffer harm, it's not a punishment. You're not being punished for walking with fools. It's simply a consequence of walking with fools. You know, we, we get a lot from the people that, we, that we're around. If we're around wise men, we pick up wise tendencies. Um, we, we tend to um, pick up things from the, the people that we're around. We will talk the same and do the same things. Um, it, it's very easy to, to become like the people that we're around. That's why it's so important for us to be around good, upstanding, strong Christians. Christians that we can make our role models. I think that, that, but then we have to, you know, you have to consider the, the, the biblical fools in this case. You know, the companion of fools will suffer harm, but what about the fools? We need to care about the fools too. I just, yeah, yeah, it's on. Um, uh, we, we need to, we need to think about the fools. I, I'm, the only reason I use the word fool, because it's really derogatory. <laughs> I use the word fools because it's in the scriptures right there, and we're talking about it. So, so biblically, the, the people that, uh, are being considered to be fools, uh, we need to consider them too because, you know, salvation is for everybody. It's for the fools too. Um, so we need to help them. We, you know, we need to, you know, in a sense, have sympathy because, you know, we were fools once too. Um, but we need to be careful not to go too deep. I, think, I feel like sometimes we want to we wanna help too much. Um, and, or, or maybe it, yeah, there's, there's, there's two ways. Either we, we feel like we want to help too much, so we immerse ourselves in, uh, in bad situations to, to be an encouragement to those people. Um, or it becomes kind of an excuse, well, I want to hang out with these bad people because, of, because they're, you know, they're my friends or that we do the same things. Um, but uh, it's, it's dangerous when we're immersed too deep because when we're around people that are not Christian, strong, upstanding Christians, people that we can make our role models, um, we, can, we can be swayed. And that's what Paul warns us. Um, I think that we really, if, if we really care about those people, then we need to consider our own safety. Um, we need to save ourselves first. We need to prioritize ourselves, our own salvation our own uh, spiritual health over the health of other people. And I know that sounds really that sounds really bad, right? You know, but you're supposed to put other people before yourself. But I think from a pr responsibility perspective, it's actually it's actually the opposite. We need to prioritize ourselves because if we are not spiritually healthy, then we cannot help anybody. So we need to we need to make sure that we are in a position where we can help other people, and that requires making sure that we're healthy. And um, as there's two two uh, examples where where other people teach this exact same thing, 
um, that I can think of just off the top of my head, and I wrote, I, I put those on this slide. Um, yes, uh, CPR trainers will tell, will teach you this. Um, airline emergency response training, they'll teach you this. Uh, if you've ever ridden on a plane, they, this is something that they tell you. But consider CPR training or lifeguard training. When you're uh, trained to be a lifeguard, or if you're trained in CPR, um, oftentimes the trainers will mention. If you see a drowning victim, uh, you, you, your inclination is to swim and to save them, right? But we're actually not supposed to, if you have a, a drowning victim, a drowning victim is, well, not someone who's going to definitely be a, a de deceased drowning victim, that's, that's up in the air. But if you see somebody drowning, you, it's your duty to help them, right? But rescuers will tell you, do not swim up to somebody who's drowning unless you have something that you can give them that they can save themselves. Because somebody who's drowning, they're looking for something to climb on top of to get out of the water. And if you go up to them, then you become a convenient flotation device. Um, and what do you do to a flotation device? You push it under the water, try to climb onto it. So if, uh, if, you're up with a, if you're in the water with a drowning victim, it's very likely that they'll try to climb on your back and hope that you swim them to shore. But unfortunately, we're only so buoyant, we can't support, you know, one person can't support two bodies. And what ends up happening is the person that with a good heart, a good kind heart, and went to save the, the person who was drowning, now that, that person's drowning, now we have two people drowning. So what they tell you to do instead is, if you're going to swim out, stay in the vicinity, give them instructions, but don't physically save them until they stop struggling and often, and usually that means that they've started drowning and they've actually started taking on water. At that point, you save them and you bring them to shore and then you, you rescue them from the shore where it's safe. So it, 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 it's, the trainers will teach you, it's it, your safety is first because if you are not safe, then you cannot, if you end up drowning too, then you, you've thrown your opportunity away to help that, that person who is drowning. And spiritually, it's, it's the same way. We need to make sure that we're, we're healthy and we're strong. And a, another example of this, the same kind of training that, uh, that is given is on the airlines. Um, any, anybody who's ever flown on a flight ever. They, they give the same spiel every single time. It's almost boring. I've been on so many, on so many flights, I could get up there and do it myself. <laughs> but uh, it, they, it's important, it, but the, every time they give this, this, this emergency training to everybody on the, 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 the show or the, the talk that they give the flight attendants to, Every time they give it, uh, it, it's every single flight. And they'll tell you, you know, your seat back cushion is a flotation device if the, the plane has to land on water, if it crashes. And then the, uh, the other, another big thing is if the cabin depressurizes, uh, then the mask will drop. And what they tell you about the mask is put your own mask on. Do not put anybody else's mask on. Do not help anybody else. Put your own mask on first, and then you can help other people. And they say they, they then target mothers, specifically mothers, put your mask on, then help your child put their mask on, your mask on first. And that's because we have a responsibility to make sure that we are, we are safe and secure because if we're not, then we can't save anybody because you know, we, need to, we need to be standing on a solid rock to, we need to be standing on solid ground to save anybody. And if we're not on that solid ground, that firm foundation, then we're, we're just as helpless as the people that we wanna save and we can't, we're just, we're all just drowning in the water, in the water at that point. So what, uh, what are we called to do once we have uh, ensured that we are safe and we're secured? We're called to then go out and save those people. Uh, we, we read one example of this in Titus chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. We're called to be so perfect that if someone comes to someone comes up and tries to to down us uh, they can't they'll look at our lives and just they, they have nothing to say they have nothing bad to say that's what we should be like you know many times we're not that case we've made mistakes and that's okay but it is our goal it is our aim to be so good that people cannot say bad things about us. And it's one, th one example, of, and I'll, I'll bring up politics for just a second, is uh, Mike Pence, the, um, the uh, vice president. I know people have tried to uh, down him. They've tried to find, you know, in politics, it's a game of how much dirt can you dig up on the opponent. Well, they've, they've uh, people, that, people that are anti-Trump, um, they're, by extension, anti-vice president. So they try to dig up stuff on the vice president, and what they find is it is an upstanding Christian man. They can't find anything, anything bad about him. It's at least not that I've heard so far. Not that I really care enough to dig myself, but from what I've heard, nobody can find anything bad about him. He's an upstanding Christian man, goes to church every single Sunday, cares about people, good man, people 
dig into his life and they find no graves. Just nice green grass. That's what we want people to find when they dig into us. How can we become wise? How can we become that perfect? How can we become so perfect that when people try to dig up stuff on us, they come up short and they come up with absolutely nothing? Well, I think that the, the answer is in that Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 13, uh, verse 20 that I, that I had up previously. He who walks with wise men will be wise. We need to walk with the wise men. And who are the wise men? The wise men and women are the women, the men and women of the church. I think the first wisest thing that you can do except Jesus as your Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. That is the wisest decision that you can make and the wisest feeling that you can have uh, if, you, if you read Solomon is just the fear of God. Those are the wisest things. And those people are in the church. So if we make those people our foundation, if we make those people the, uh, the people that we fellowship the most often, uh, fellowship with the most often, we'll be very safe and very secure. And at that point, we'll be, we will be able to be those rescuers that we're called to be, uh, be that role model that we're called to be in Titus chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. So how can we do that? Well, I've developed, so my gift to you, I've developed a three-step plan to success. Sorry, everybody's laughing at me. I'm serious. <laughs> it's a, a three-step plan to success. Um, and it is identify, encourage, emulate. Three-step three step plan, I-E-E. -E. So wh what does that mean? Identify is that we, we should really look at each other and, in, like I said, in a good way, um, examine each other. Um, I, I, I say the first step is to identify. Identify is a very active looking process. When you, when you identify something, you look really deep and then you make an observation. Um, and when we look at our siblings, we should, we should admonish each other when it's necessary, uh, but we should also look for the really good in each other. And this is something that I think that we often forget to do. I know that we often forget to do because, oh, I'm one of we and I forget to do it. Um, but we really need to look um, look deep into our brothers and sisters and find the things that just they are really good at and the, the things that just show Jesus in who they are. Once we find those things, we should encourage them. I think something that we forget to do is we should we need to tell people about those those traits that they have or that, that, that one trait that just sets them apart, sets them so high because everybody, everybody has this. Everybody has something. The, what sets them apart um, is just tell them, encourage them because if people want to hear it. it people, sometimes people, they're really good at something. They're very Christ-like and even if it's just one aspect and they're way far off and everything else, but that just, just one aspect, sometimes people don't realize that and when you walk up to them and you tell them, hey, I've noticed this, you are just very good and it's encouraged me. And that's so encouraging, so encouraging. And if we do that, we, we lift, everybody lifts each other up and it's, it's just wonderful. And then finally, third, uh, identify, uh, encourage, and then emulate. We, when we find those good things in each other, we should, uh, it should be our goal, we should set a goal to nurture those qualities uh, with, within ourselves. Um, we should do what we can to, to grow that quality within ourselves once we've identi identified it. Um, if we do that, if we all do that, we'll slowly, step by step, get stronger and closer uh, in resemblance to Jesus. Um, when we look at Jesus, you might say that, well, the only role model that I need is Jesus. Well, when we look at Jesus, and that, that is, I guess you could say that that's true, but the, when we look at Jesus, it's easy to be discouraged because we compare Jesus' life with our life, and we just, it's so far off, we're just so messed up, and then we look at Jesus, and he's perfect, and it encourages our, us for a second, and then we look at ourselves, and we're like, man, I have a long way to go, and when you look at something, and you've got a long way to go, it's discouraging, but when we look at our brothers and we, our sisters, we see them struggle, we see them fail at times, we, we root for them, but we can be encouraged because they're people just like us, they they do good in some places and they do bad in other places. And we can, we, can be, we can be encouraged by our successes and by our failures. And that's why it's a little bit more encouraging, I think, to look at our brothers and sisters in the church and find encouragement through them. Um, and then we find our, our focus in Jesus Christ. That's how we identify what is good and what is bad through the absolute truth. I, I listed a few, few good traits. Um, this, there's just seven up there, I think. Inclusion is including people being respectful, um, 
privately criticizing people instead of scorning them publicly, people that uphold biblical standards, uh, people that are always loving, always forgiving, people that are humble, people that don't draw attention to their own successes, but they attribute their success to God. Those are just, those are just a few things, but there's, there's so many different things that make us really good and really Christ-like, even if it's just one thing, just find it in somebody, tell them, and then make it a goal to nurture that within yourself. So we can, it, when we look for people to identify and encourage and emulate, um, is there's, there's two places that I think that we can really go. I think that within the church, as I mentioned, is one really good place. But then the other really good place is the Bible. There are so many people in the Bible. We, read, we see our own trip ups and our, and our failures, but we also read about them in the Bible. There's so many good people in the Bible that were upstanding, but we can see them fail. As I, people say that David was a murderer. David was one of the most spiritual, amazing people of the Bible, but he also, uh, he essentially committed murder for a woman at, at that. It's, so we, we can, we can see success and we can see failure in both, both the people of the church, we can be encouraged by it, but we can also see it in the people of the Bible. Um, and it's that David's just one example. I wanted to talk this morning about one person that I find to be incredibly uplifting, uh, somebody that is my absolute favorite person in the Bible, excluding Jesus, obviously, because it would be sacrilegious to say anything else. <laughs> but behind, behind Jesus is my absolute favorite person in the Bible because I can look up to him uh, and I, I will I will mention that yes it is it is a man so you, you get that hint <laughs> um, but is I look I, I, he's a man that I can I can model myself after and when I when I say this person is my absolute favorite in the Bible and I tell people who it is they, t they turn their head and they look at me and they're like out of everybody in the Bible you pick that man really is it and, and it makes sense because my favorite person is Simon the Magician. I think I missed a, a click there. Um, so Simon the Magician, we're, and we're introduced to Simon the Magician in Acts uh, chapter 8, verses 9 through 13. Verse 9, now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving attention to him because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Simon the magician, the great power of God, is now the, the one who's amazed by the, by the real powers of God, the apostles. So we, we jump forward uh, nine verses to verse 18, uh, still in chapter 8. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I may lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. And this is, I, Simon made a big mistake here. Is yeah, When we're young, when we don't fully understand, uh, we, we make mistakes, and sometimes we say the wrong thing. This is a moment where Simon said the wrong thing. He's just, he, was, he was probably thinking that, oh, you're giving this to everybody else for free, but I don't even need it for free. Let me give you something that you, and then I'll get this from you in return, and it'll be more of a trade, and that's, that's more fair, right? Because that's what, how worldly people think. They don't understand the value of the Holy Spirit, and that is where Simon made his mistake. He did not truly understand the value of the Holy Spirit. And when he said that he, when he essentially said that he could make a trade, when we can typically consider trade, you, you see equal value on both sides. But when you have money on one side and the Holy Spirit on the other, there is no, it's a big wah. And, and from what Simon was saying, it seemed to indicate that he thought that, you know, the Holy Spirit could be bought. And man, Peter laid him low. Verse 20, but Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. 
You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, if it is so possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and he said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. I see Peter on his knees at this point, begging Peter, please enter into petition for the Lord, and for my, on my behalf to the Lord, that, that he may forgive me, that he may craft me, that he may repair me, that he may mold me. God, I know that I am broken. Please change me. That's what Peter said. I, that's, 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 what, that's what Simon said in response to Peter. So how, how do we respond to criticism? I'm, I'm reminded of a proverb, Proverb 25, 12. Like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. And man, Peter was made of gold to Simon. Instead of criticizing Simon, instead of criticizing Peter, instead of lashing back out at Peter, Simon responded with love and humility in exactly the way that he should have. He recognized that he'd made a mistake, and he asked for help and understanding. And he asked that others would go into prayer on his behalf so that he might understand more. Now, how often do we respond in this way when we're criticized, especially openly, publicly, and harshly? I mean, when you, if you think of an ant on the ground, it's like Peter shoved his boot on that ant and just twisted it. it was, he ground Simon into the dirt. This was, uh, when you look at the situation here, Simon had a, a great following that thought he was the great power of God. All of a sudden, these better people come along, and then Simon says something that's just something that's out of step. It really it, he, he deserved the reprimand. I'm not saying that he didn't, but man, he was ground in, and this was in front of everybody. This is most likely in front of everybody that followed Simon. He just laid low. That how do how do you respond in that situation? So Simon had three options. He could have done what he, he could have done the right thing uh, in humility and love, asked for help, and that's, that's what he did. But uh, he could have also you gone into hiding, tried to hide so that uh, it would be less embarrassing. You try to avoid future public confrontations for fear that he would be exposed. He didn't do that. He could have lashed out at Peter. He didn't do that either. He didn't defend his motives. He didn't say, oh, well, well wait, that's not what I meant. He, he said, you're right, I'm wrong, please help me. How often do we respond that way? Do we see the people that reprove us, that, 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 um, that, that offer reproof, that admonish us, uh, as, earring, as you know, we don't value earrings of gold um, and ornaments of fine gold, perhaps, as much as the, the people of the times that that proverb did, but uh, do, you va do you highly value people that reprove you? Is it, we should, Simon did. Simon was in a situation of responsibility, public view. People could see him. He was essentially a role model to people because they, they looked at him. They thought he was the great power of God. They were amazed by him. Now he's laid low. But because he had a following, if he wanted to keep that following, he needed to do the right thing. Because he was, in, I wonder if Simon would have acted differently if, if this wasn't such a public thing. Because that, that public view, when you misstep publicly, it, you're required to step into action a lot sooner than if something's private. It's because people saw it. The responsibilities, when we're, when we're in the public view, these are things that, that cause us to grow a lot. Simon had followers those followers converted to Christianity, and they, they probably didn't condemn him. They probably, they weren't, they weren't seeking to condemn, I'm, I'm assuming, because I don't know much more about his following, and I'm still assuming that they were still following him because it's likely. But if they'd converted to Christianity, they probably were learning to have good 
humble, loving hearts. And with a following like that, is the, the people that see us misstep, they don't, they don't want us to, they don't want us to fall. They want to encourage us. They're there with us. I think that that's, that's what, Simon had support in his following because they were fellow Christians. They had become his brothers and his sisters instead of just his followers. So that we need, we need to remember that even when we misstep publicly or misstep in front of a people, a few people, if those people are our brothers and sisters in Christ, they're not rooting for our failure. They're rooting for our success. They want us to grow. And they're right there with us. You know, we have the, the full support of the body of Christ in everything that we do. We will be admonished, but we root for each other. We want the best for each other. Simon's situation of you know, public, uh, almost public shame, but more, more important, importantly, the, the responsibility that he had um, and the, the position that he was in with people viewing him reminded me of something that you know, happened when I was a kid. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of the show Extreme Home Makeover. Um, as it started around 2003, 2004, I was about 11. Um, but my parents loved the show, and I'd watch it because it's cool. You need to watch a house get torn down as now that's that's cool, <laughs> and and then rebuilt in a week, a whole week. That's it, five days, 24 hours a day. And they just pull, knock a house down, and pull it back up, or they'll remodel it from the inside to the outside. But in a week, they redo a house. Man, it takes years to build houses. A week, this TV show, that was so cool. And what was even cooler is when they selected a house on my street, just a couple houses, uh, a couple blocks down from me. I could not believe it. I was 11 year olds, I was like 11 year olds, and 11 years old, and I was like, a TV show is coming not only to my town, but my street. Man, that's awesome, yeah. And I didn't, I didn't personally know the family, but the way that this works is Extreme Home Makeover will choose a family in need or someone, this a family that's uh, suffered tragedy or extended loss, or they've been on, suffering ongoing, and they'll choose them, and then they'll rebuild their houses, you know, kind of a, a donation, um, is an offering of, of help. And that's what happened to this family on Madeira Way in Livermore, just down from where I lived. In fact, the kids had uh, gone to school. I didn't know them directly, but I knew people that knew them. Um, because the, the youngest were just a, just a little bit older than me. Um, and we'd, we'd gone to the same schools. I, did, I didn't know him directly, but I knew people that knew him. So it was, it was a little bit closer. Anyways, um, but anyway, this, this, this situation with these kids, what, what caused them to be selected, it was, it's hard. The, uh, there were two parents, Diane and Mark, and they had six kids, six kids between them. Diane suffered a heart attack in her house. So it, it saw, a heart attack can take you in a second. So she, she collapsed in her house, just gone. Kids come home, find her lying on the floor. Like, can you imagine coming home from school? The youngest of them was 12, 14, 12 and 14. Can you imagine coming home from school and seeing your mom lying dead on the floor? It's like, I wish that I could say, I, I almost wish that I could say that I could empathize with them, but I can't. And I don't want to. I don't want to know what that kind of pain feels like. That just hurts. And I can't, I don't even, I cannot, my mind cannot comprehend that, that level of pain. I've just never been through it. That's like massive PTSD level pain. I've never seen that. I'm glad that I've never seen it. But, and I want to say that I feel with the people that, that have suffered that pain, but I, I can't, I can't even imagine how bad it is. 12 years old to find your mother, it's gone. Well, it got worse. I've seen this happen a few times in recent history. You know, someone will pass, and then a week later, a couple weeks later, or a few months later, the first passing will be pretty abrupt, and it just shocks everybody, and then bam, somebody else goes. Well, that's what happened to them. Two weeks later, Mark, the dad, gone. Died of a heart attack in the home, lying on the floor, found by the kids. Can you imagine that? All right, you're, you're grieving. Your mom just died. You had no... It's one thing if somebody's slowly going, and you know it, and then they go, and it's like... Her time was coming, we knew it, we were prepared for it, but if in the middle of just normal life, bam, someone's gone. Say someone's hit by a car and they're gone. So it falls and has a heart attack and they're gone. So you're, no one's prepared for that, it's rough. And for it to happen to two people, let alone those, pe those two people be the sole, the only parents of six kids, how do you get through that? Well, the kids pulled through, they were, this happened, uh, I don't know how long before their home was made over. 
that this happened. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but uh, that, that's why they were chosen. There were six kids living in a house. Both parents had quickly died within the space of two weeks. They were both just gone. And the kids had to pick up the slack. And they were put into a position of responsibility. They, had to, they, they either had to grow or just get out, allow themselves to fail. As, as kids, you know, kids, they, they need the structure and the support of parents. It, it helps them. But when parents disappear, what then? Well, the, uh, the kids were, uh, there were two 23-year-olds, a 19-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 12-year-old. So at least they had some older brothers and sisters with them. But still, six kids, and they were left to pick everything up. They all had to get jobs. They had to work. And their house was in shambles because they were just barely scraping by. They were barely making it. No parents to keep the order. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I was young and I had siblings living with me, you know, there was strife. There was strife. Imagine that strife with no parents around. And two of the older kids, you know, who the, the younger kids are all, already annoyed by because they're always, you know, they, they've got a, a level of freedom that the younger kids don't. Imagine them having to, you know, take over the family. Is the strife that happens there, it's difficult. And their house was a mess. It was in shambles. The floors were gone. Uh, the house looked messed up. This, uh, this is what it looked like on the outside before and then after they remodeled it. You know, the, the extreme home makeover, the, the people that select people were so touched by the story and what was currently going on at that time uh, what's ha what was happening with these six kids, that up to this point, they had never left the Los Angeles area. But for this, they, drove, they moved six hours north to central California, where I lived, on my street, to help these kids. And they actually, um, from what I read, they, there was a budget to redo their house. They blew through the budget in the first day. So the first day out of five days, they blew through the budget. And after that, everything was volunteer. Everything was donations. I know a company came and replaced all the windows in the house. For, and it was about $20,000 worth of labor. It was all, they just did it for the family. Because once, once everybody heard about what these kids were going through, man, the entire community just jumped in. Because the, the budget, and the, uh, what I also wonder is how a, a TV station had a small budget to, to replace a house. Was, you know, they must have been raking in the dough. Because everybody was watching that. But... But they blew through their budget on the first day, and everything after that was volunteer. This company donates twenty thousand dollars. Yes, that's good. It's you know, it, people people have hearts. These kids were put into a position of responsibility. They either, they either had to step up or step out and let someone else take over. They had to, it was either grow up, get out, step up, step aside. It was they either had to act or let somebody take over. They chose to act. They chose to do what they needed to do to get by. Kind of like, and their, their situation is a lot worse than Simon. Simon was kind of like a pride situation. He would have simply lost his following. The people that he wanted to look up to him. Is, these kids would have lost their livelihood if they didn't, if they didn't step up. So the, you know, the, the circumstances are definitely more weightier leaning towards the kids. But it's the, it's the, it's the same thing. Both were, were called into a position of responsibility and they had to act suddenly. And both did the right thing. When we see each other stumble, it encourages us, like I said. It's harder to share with people who are perfect. So even though we have to suffer pain, and you know, um, growth like this, intense growth, always hurts. It always comes with affliction. We, we always seem to grow in times of affliction. And as, as I, I think that's why these things, kinds of things are dealt to us. But in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God tells us that, you know, uh, he's never going to give us more than we, more than we can handle. Uh, but he is looking to change us. He is looking to transform us. And sometimes, if we can handle it, that comes with a massive bang. It did for the kids. I don't, I don't know that uh, they were Christian. It was in California, so they probably weren't. Um, and I wasn't at the time. Um, but Simon, he had the full support of his brothers and sisters. And when, when he needed to change, he did. And when he couldn't do it himself, he, had, he went into petition for the Lord, and he asked others to go into petition for the Lord for him, that he might be able to change. 
if we pretend that we don't struggle, if we make it look easy, then we, we kind of put other people off because, you know, this is a hard walk that we have. And if we hide our struggles, then it doesn't give any, any it's a, younger Christians don't have anything to relate to. They, they look at us and they're like, man, that guy just had, he's just so good and he's so, he's just such a great guy and he's like, he never struggles with anything. But in reality, you might, you might have struggled with a lot. But if you don't show you're struggling, let it be open, be transparent, then other people have nothing to be encouraged by. And so it's important for us to let our struggles be seen. So when we, when we falter, let, don't hide it. Let other people see it. Let it be encouragement for other people. We're not, we're not perfect. We, need, we really do need people to look up to. As, as adults, even though you know, we kind of, we, we've kind of established ourselves, we need to remember that we do need to look outside of ourselves. We need to remember to look at our brothers and sisters and identify good qualities within them, identify those good qualities, and encourage our brothers and sisters who have those qualities, and then try to nurture those same qualities within ourselves. And if we all do that, I know, I don't just think, I know that we will become a super strong body of Christ. Nothing will be able to break us. So I, I learn a lot from Simon. Simon is the number one man that I look up to in the Bible, besides Jesus. Yeah, the other two, when people, when, when it come, comes up, one of my favorite three people are in the Bible, there's two other people in the Bible that had an absolutely massive impact on the church today. It's because of who they were. The Barnabas, who was so named because he was an encourager, has absolutely massive impact on the church. A lot of things that happen in the book of Acts happen largely because of Barnabas was who he was. Stephen, was a, the first Christian martyr, was a literal match lighter because of what, who Stephen was and how honest and loving he was. He absolutely changed the church. That's stuff that I want to talk about tonight. Um, I couldn't, I actually wanted to talk about them all in one, in one sermon, but I, then I realized, man, I'm going to be sitting there for an hour. So I was like, well, you know, I still want to say, so I'll break it off and I'll talk about Simon in the morning. And, and tonight I'm going to look at uh, Barnabas and Stephen. And if you've been encouraged by Simon, I pray that you would join us tonight as we, uh, as we examine, as we identify the good traits in Barnabas and Stephen. And we can't encourage Barnabas and Stephen because you, they're not with us anymore, but we can nurture those same qualities within ourselves once we identify them. I pray that you would, um, if you've been encouraged by Simon, that you would join us tonight as we look into those, those two people of the Bible who I find to be incredibly good role models. So, do you long to be transformed? In Romans 12, 2, Paul wrote, Paul wrote, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And God wishes this for all of us. As he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And in 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter wrote the same thing. Peter wrote that the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And Titus 2.11, which I mentioned uh, this morning, uh, I believe, says the same thing. For the, God, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. And G God and Jesus have presented his offering to you, to everybody. It is God's will that we would all change. So if it is in your heart, if you, have a, if you have a need to respond, I pray that you would come forward this morning. If you hear the call, ba call of baptism, I pray that you would come forward this morning as we stand and we sing our closing song. Thank you. Amen.